Hello, everyone. This is A Bit of Business on behalf of Learmedia.tv and the British and Irish Trading Alliance. Welcome to the show. My name is John Fitzgerald. A Bit of Business is all about bringing interesting people and interesting topics together. And once again, today is no exception. Our interesting topic today is resilience a subject that is relevant to all of us as we navigate these challenging times. We have two special guests today. Our first guest is Sandy Donnelly, the founder of DBC Health Retreat, and her mission is to make fitness fun, inspirational, and educational, and she certainly does do that. Our second guest is Will Polston, he is the founder of Make It Happen, and Will works with leaders, entrepreneurs, and ambitious professionals to unlock their full potential and literally make it happen. It promises to be a fascinating and value-added conversation. As ever, ladies and gentlemen, please do go to the BITA website for more information about upcoming events and fascinating initiatives across the BITA community, like the Be Plastic Aware campaign, which started recently. And that's all about raising the level of awareness around the amount of plastic that we're using, and also encouraging people to take some action to reduce the amount of plastic that we use on a daily basis. So that's it. Sandy Donnelly and Will Polston coming up next. Please do stay tuned. And we're now live with Sandy Donnelly and Will Poston to talk about resilience, specifically the physical and mental aspects. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. A very quick rapid fire question. Your best prediction for when we'll be able to conduct our next interview face to face in a pub. Sandy? Oh, prediction. May the 5th. <laughs> May the 5th. Will? Oh, we're going accurate. Um, I, I'm going to say uh, a little bit later than that. I, I think middle of June. Oh, I look forward to that. Won't that be a, a real treat for us? Oh. Anyway, look, resilience is a topic that is relevant to everyone watching today. And even if people wouldn't admit it, in fact, probably especially so if people wouldn't admit it, because so much has been thrown at us over the last 12 months or so, it's pretty hard not to feel a little overwhelmed or stretched in some way, shape or form. But there is hope. And our special guests today are purveyors of that hope. Sandy and Will are experts in the physical and mental aspects of resilience and the tools that we can all use to feel a little bit more in control. Sandy, you're well known for your healthy retreats in very pleasant, sunny locations, in fact. And you've recently started to run those remotely, given the times that we're, we're living in. And in fact, you just ran one this past weekend uh, and it went really, really well because I know I talked to some people who were on it and they were raving about it. So good for you. A slight pivot for you in your business, but it's working out well. Will? You're a certified coach, an LLP master practitioner, and a TEDx speaker. You help people live purposeful, inspired, and energized lives. 11 months in, you've hit 20,000 downloads of your Make It Happen podcast last week. So congratulations and well done. Clearly, people are listening. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. So it's over that or my mum's just got it on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's working too. So good stuff. But let me start on the physical side of resilience with Sandy, please. And I saw a definition recently. So let me just read that out. Physical resilience refers to the body's capacity to adapt to challenge, maintain stamina and strength in the face of significant demands, and recover efficiently and effectively when damaged. Sandy, is, is this a fair summary? And also, what physical impacts have you felt personally 
and seen in the people that you've worked with over the last 12 months? I think particular that that's a fair, very fair statement. I think particularly it's been challenging, but particularly this lockdown because we've obviously got not the such good weather. It's a bit more strict, you know, as in to be able to go out and get some physical activity. Um, so building that physical and mental resilience through this lockdown, I think has been a lot more challenging. And particularly I'm a hands-on person. So I train people directly, um, see people face to face. I hug people, I can't hug anybody. Um, and my health retreats, I bring people, small groups of people abroad to nice destinations and all of that has gone. So the only way for me to make any adaption was we, we've got to go with the flow and go with what's going to work for people because this is for the unforeseeable future. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. So virtually it's been the way forward and I think it will continue this way. So the challenges there are, obviously you're not seeing somebody face to face. So I know a lot of people who would be normally active and outside or, you know, getting their exercise, they've really, really struggled, you know, really struggled because although there's numerous um, and free online workouts for people to follow, but unless you've got that self-motivation to be able to get up and go and say, yes, I'll follow it, I'll do it then at this time, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. So then what are you going to do? Are you going to go out for your daily walk? Are you going to go do some other kind of physical activity just to get your, to improve your health, your mental and your physical health on a week to week basis? And even down to, you know, um, we estimate you should do about 10,000 steps per day. I even noticed like on my watch, you know, some days, because I'm not used to being on a laptop, I'm, I'm out, you know, I'm in and out all day long. So my steps, you know, are, I do plenty of steps on a day-to-day -day basis, plus I run. And I noticed some days it would be 12, one o'clock and I would be up to only 3000 steps. And one day I looked and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, so for me, even I'm very self-motivated. I can get myself up, I can get myself out. I don't need someone to say, come on, do it. But just looking at those steps made me think, I don't want this to be my life. I don't want this to be my new life that I'm, because I have to be in, we have to be home. What am I gonna do? So I started, I work on an island, not a tropical island. I mean, my kitchen island, which I've built. And fortunately it's, it's high, so I can stand up. So I'll be stood up, I'll sit down, I'll wander around, I'll get myself out. I go to the, I live in central London, so, Oxford Street, all the shops, everything being closed. It's really sad, Covent Garden everywhere. But I make sure I walk up to the furthest shop, which is John Lewis Waitrose, <laughs> to try and get my steps in. You know, just so just making those tiny little changes to, to just be a bit more physically active. But I think it's, it's a big concern, and um, particularly for families with children, homeschooling children as well. And I think that's a very fair comment Sandy, and it segues very nicely into a similar question for Will, because look, physical activity is fantastic, but if you don't have the oomph, if you don't have the mental discipline to get up and get out, it's for nothing. So these two aspects are inextricably linked, I think. And let me turn to you now, Will, and give you another definition. And this one is Mental resilience is the ability to emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to pre-crisis status quickly. Resilience exists when the person uses mental processes and behaviors to protect the self from stress. So same question to you, Will. Is this a fair assessment, do you think? And what mental impacts have you felt personally and then seen in the folks that you've worked with over uh, the last 12 months? Absolutely. I, I definitely think it's a fair assessment. I think there's a couple of things I want to, I want to pick up on. I'm sort of, as you mentioned, trained in neurolinguistic programming. I'm, I'm very particular about language and quite often I'll study the etymology, the original origin of a word to get an understand, a true understanding of, of how we're using it. And the word crisis, if we take the word crisis in, in Chinese, they have two brush strokes for the word crisis. Um, and one of those brushstrokes means danger 
and the other means opportunity. In any, any crisis, we have an opportunity and there's an opportunity that we can take if we choose to. And when you can see the blessings in a crisis, that's when you can really take control. And, and I think a lot of mental resilience starts with responsibility, actually. And again, if we take the word responsibility and we break it down, responsibility, it's your ability to respond to any particular event that's taking place or anything that happens. And I have a uh, a, a, a formula, what I call the formula to life that I, I live by and I get my clients to live by, which is E plus R equals O, which is event add response equals outcome. And an event is any form of external stimuli, anything that could happen, a situation or uh, being told about a new tier system or not being able to go out or not being able to do things. And what most of us do because of our brain, there's the, the, the oldest part of our brain, the amygdala, um, is the, the part of the brain that is the, the reptilian brain, as it's known, is what enables us to react. So we react to situations. But we've all had times in the past where weeks, months, days later, we reflect back on something and go, oh, in hindsight, that was actually a really good thing. But we, we suffered for a period of time or were in pain in that moment because we, we, we were fixed in a particular way of seeing something. But it's that perspective that changes it. And that's the difference between reacting and responding. A response is when we're using sort of the, the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, to think differently about a situation, see it from a different perspective, which then creates that different outcome. So I think that's, um, that, that's definitely something that, that we can uh, we, we have the ability to do when it comes to, to mental resilience. And you, you said about stress. And, and most people, when they think of stress, they think of stress as a bad thing. But th there's two different types of stress. There's distress and there's eustress. And there's a fantastic study. If, if you, you you look up Yerkes-Dodson, there's known as the Yerkes-Dobson curve, which sort of r rises up and then falls down. You've got an axis, sort of y-axis and x-axis. And the, those axes essentially mean what's the, the, the performance level. So your performance versus the, um, uh, the uh, arousal level. So if you're highly aroused, um, if you're aroused too much, then you're going to break down. If you're not aroused enough, then you're going to be bored. And at both of those ends are, are distress, whereas you stress is in the middle, which is sort of optimal stress, peak performance stress, having a bit of pressure. It's a bit like an elastic band. If I have an elastic band, if, if I have it in its usual state, it has no real use. It just you can only use it to sort of swing, swing around on your finger. And that's about it. If I put it under a bit of tension, it's got some use. I can use it to hold things. I can use it to flick at people. Um, it, it's got uses. Whereas if I put it under too much stress and it's going to snap. So the, the, the way that we, we can do that when we're, when we're thinking about our mental resilience is rather than constantly being under pressure, the same way with an elastic band, we can put ourselves under pressure and then come back to a relaxing state, put ourselves under pressure and come back to a relaxing state. And like with this type of work that Sandy will do when people are going out and exercising and, 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 and doing that, they're pushing themselves and exercise is, is so, physical movement in, of any sort is so important when we're in stressful times because our body or our, our, our brain releases chemicals in the form of cortisol and adrenaline when we're under stress, which once upon a time we would have used to run away from saber toothed tigers. But these days the stress is watching an announcement on Boris, from Boris Johnson on TV or getting the email that we, was, that we didn't want about the client that's cancelling the contract because of the circumstances of whatever it is. And when we go out and exercise, we're able to burn off that cortisol and, and that adrenaline um, to help bring ourselves back to the the, the the appropriate state that we want to be in. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a great, great summary. And what you're talking about there, Will, is, is spot on. And I'm thinking in the context of sport, because a lot of athletes talk about getting into the zone. Mm. And that's exactly it's the peak performance time. So when you wake up first thing in the morning, you're not going to be at your best optimally fully charged, fully focused, you're sort of waking up. And then as the day progresses, you get into important meetings, perhaps, or you're playing around a golf or you, you have to be very focused on a task and your senses are heightened and, and you can really sort of laser uh, beam onto the task at hand to perform at your best. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes at the very end of the day or the end of the week, if you've been overstretched throughout the week, you're, you're sort of beyond the, the, the limit of the optimal zone and, and your, your performance drops off. So in, in the sports context, in the professional context, it's hugely relevant. 
And can you, could you both perhaps, maybe Sandy, you could start here, just give us a, a sense for some of the consequences that you have seen in folks that you've been working with over the last uh, six or 12 months on, on the physical side because of lockdown and because of the lack of ability to get out and be physically active or be motivated to go and be physically activated? Um, definitely huge, huge changes, um, visible changes. I think one of them is definitely mood, you know, people's mood, you know, because physical activity is as good for the brain as it is for the body. So this can change people's energy levels. So their mood changes, their stress levels, etc. And weight gain. This is one of the huge, huge ones. So, so if people are spiraling into this already, they're gaining weight because they're not being so active. They're not eating as healthier. So the mood is changing, the energy levels, the stress levels, and this is all spiraling into one. So we're trying to, I'm trying to snap people out of this. And one of the things I've said, particularly in this lockdown, come on, let's get something out of this. Let's, let's achieve something. Why wouldn't you, wouldn't you be delighted to come out of this and say, actually change my body shape or I lost those few pounds. I've, I did couch to 5k, you know, something as simple as that, you know, some form of physical activity, which they may not have usually, usually done, you know, or been used to. Um, but I can see people, people drifting away from me. They'll then dip back in again. They, they, they go off again. And I'm trying to continuously come on. Are you OK? You know, to motivate them and to lift them up. And I mean, even myself on a personal level, I've been affected um, financially terribly. You know, I lost all everything really for the for the last 12 months. There's, there were no none of my health retreats um, have been able to go ahead. And I've still, we still have that uncertainty of, well, when will this, when will we be back to normal that people can fly or they're not afraid to, should we book that ticket? And I totally understand. And then, so I can't take the risk of booking it either. So for myself, sometimes I'm like, okay, I've got to motivate myself also to be able to motivate others. Thank God, you know, I'm quite motivated. I'm a very positive person. So whatever gets me down, I, I can pick myself up thankfully quite quickly and say right next thing what can I do hence the adaption to the virtual training but you know calling on people messaging them and not just for, not not to get work from them it's on because I'll be honest I've not charged for anything I've been doing over the last except for the the retreat recently over the last year because I want to help people I think it's a genuine cause for people because you're going to see them with this extra weight loss and with these different moods and you know some of my friends who have young children are they're really being affected they're working you know full-time mum and dad's at home tearing each other's hair out they've got small children they're trying to occupy I mean I've set up as well some um, movement and meditation for children so I do these uh, sessions to do some yoga moves, a little meditation in a childlike way, because kids are being affected. And if they can't even take them to the park or, you know, outside for a bit, I can understand that must be, it's very challenging. So, And Will, I guess when you, you've been working with folks and you've sort of moved to a, a virtual model as well in the last 12 months. So, so can you comment on how people are presenting to you on camera and, and what they're thinking, what their motivation is. And also, can you, can you give us a bit of an insight into the whole area of behavior change and what it takes to actually change behavior? Because it's really hard. It's really hard to change your own behavior, never mind motivate somebody else to change their behavior. And remote leaders now are ch trying to change the behavior of organizations. It's extremely challenging. So perhaps you could comment on that as well and, and on what you're seeing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate that, that I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners who typically have a tendency to want to solve problems. You know, generally they're problem solvers. 
So it's like, right, these are the cards we've been dealt. We'll roll with it. You know, Sandy just mentioned, she's had to change everything, do things very differently. I know you've had to do things differently. And so many other people that I have that are in that world that, that have had to, to evolve and adapt and change. And that's kind of second nature to a lot of the people that I work with because they're just used to dealing with problems anyway. Um, I, I think what, what definitely has impacted so many people is that it's been such a dramatic change and being able to let go of things that are out of their control. And, and that, for me, is where I really see the suffering. The people that really are suffering are the people that are trying to control the uncontrollables. And just rather than focusing on what they can control, which are within their realm of control, we've got what we can control, which I'll share with what they are at the moment, and we've got things that we can influence. But there's certain things that we just have absolutely no involvement over, and we can fight against it and fight against it. It's like swimming against the tide, you know? Um, we, we can keep swimming against the tide and go nowhere, or we can get in a boat and let the tide take us, but sort of use a rudder to, to steer us in a bit of a direction. So... Um, the, the, the three things that we control ultimately are our perceptions, our actions and our decisions. That's it. That's all that we ever control. So if, if things aren't going the way that we want them to be, then we, we have to change that. One of my favorite quotes is if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. And um, that, that's something that, that definitely needs to be done. Um, and then when it comes to changing behaviors and, and habits, um, I am a huge fan of a particular model. It's not my model, but I'll, I'll share it with a guy that, that came up with this many years ago called Robert Diltz, and it's called Neurological Levels of Change. So when most people want to change, they change at a behavior level, which the, the best way of, of, uh, of, of using an analogy is a bit like a stream, right? If you've got um, lots, if, if, you, if you've got a, a stream that sort of goes into a river, you, you've got obviously the mouth of the river where there's a lot more water flowing or you've got sort of further upstream where it's just a trickle. It's a lot easier to stop the the the, the river um, at the trickle than it is to stop it at the mouth of the river because it's got all that momentum that's carrying through. And the way that we do that um, in the work that I do in, in, is using it's or it's Robert Dilt's model, like I say, is, is imagine a triangle. And um, if I sort of go from the top down, so you have your purpose, what's the reason why you're doing what you're doing? Then you have your identity, anything that you say I am to, you are. So people have an identity, uh, a picture in their mind's eye of how they present themselves and how things should be. Then you have your values and beliefs. Again, beliefs is just simply a, a, an opinion of how something should be. Then you have your skills and capabilities. Then you have your behaviors and then you have your environment. So at the top is, is purpose, then identity, um, then values and beliefs, then skills and capabilities, then behaviors, then environment. And a lot of people, they try and change their behaviors and they wonder why things don't change. Whereas if we change at a higher level, if we go up and go, right, how can I change my identity? Do I need to change my values and beliefs? And that's the paradigm that a lot of people have had to change this last year is how things should be. Work should be going to an office and, and operating, whereas actually I can change my, my belief around that and then my behaviours around work start to change and so on and so forth in that instance. So um, that, that's the, the, the basics of it. But like anything, um, and, and Sandy, no doubt, will have some, some great tips on this as well. I, I believe with any habit that you're looking to change, is start small, you know, whatever that is, enable yourself to build that momentum, um, rather than going for these radical shifts, which are great when you've got lots of willpower, and it's new and it's fresh, but you want to make it so easy, that you can't say no, even on the days where you don't really want to do the, the, the change, whatever that change might be. Um, and what that does is it enables self esteem to be built, because we've all had situations whereby there's something we've really wanted to do, we said, yep, I'm going to do it, we set the barrier really high, we do it for a week or so, and then we don't do it. And then the next day we don't do it. And then not only are we getting the, 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 the negative of not doing the thing that we said we want to do, we then beat ourselves up mm. for not doing the thing we said we would do. So we're diminishing our self-esteem. Whereas if you keep it really small, um, so you get a double whammy of, of pain in that instance, but if you keep it really small, you're able to not only build momentum, but you're able to build self-esteem as well. Well, you know, if you if you uh, start small, if you write it down, if you communicate it and talk about it uh, and, and you have other people involved in helping you achieve what you want to achieve, that gives you an optimal chance, I think, of changing your behavior and succeeding and getting that momentum. And it just reminds me of our session uh, a couple of days ago, Sandy, actually yesterday morning, Sandy had <laughs> us doing high interval intense training 
for, for 10 minutes on the Zoom call. And it's been quite a while since I've done HIT training, Sandy. And I'm a little yeah. sore today, but we started small and you, you just sort of feel like you're getting a bit of momentum. Um, so now, folks, I want to get a little bit more scientific here. And, you know, I've, I'm quite interested in, in literature and scientific studies and all that sort of stuff. And I saw an article, uh, it was a recent paper in the European Journal of Neuropsychopharmacology. Try saying that after a couple of pints. Again, <laughs> uh, it was published mid-pandemic last year. And there's a quote in there that stood out for me. And I want to just touch on one point in this quote. These are stressful times, particularly since the stressor is new. The absence of warning precluded preparation and pre-adaptation and no antidotes or vaccinations were readily available. So this is this the suddenness of this when it hit last year. I'd love to just get your sense on, on, on the impact and the consequence of the fact that it was so sudden and it wasn't building over time. It was just boom, you're straight into lockdown. What do you do? So, so what are your thoughts on that and that suddenness and how we react to sudden change and stress? Sandy? I, th I think if when it, when it happened, you kind of mentally think, oh, this isn't real. This isn't really happening. I think because we had this, you know, I know it was March time when we, we went to the first lockdown. And, you know, my mother's 81, so she kill me for saying that, um, her age, but she's 81. So I think because it was hitting the elderly people more um, initially, the, the vulnerable people, I think for us as a whole, we were kind of a bit, oh, it's, it's, it's not so bad as, it, as it's really looking. And there's no way I personally even would have thought it would have been prolonged for so long. I mean, and for us, to make adaption. So, so on a business side of things for me personally, I was kind of like, oh, it's fine. You know, I'll work on a few other things, but then it's like, okay, what other things? So I, I adapted, tried to work on a few other bits. And then I think we got to um, September, October and I thought, okay, these other bits I'm working on, I better up my game a bit on a financial perspective. Hold on, I want my business to work, but when when is this over? When when are we coming out of this? We we don't know. It, there was the uncertainty still, so I started to even look for um, work, which I was like, I don't want to have to work for somebody when I work for myself. You know, I don't want to have to start this. And in a way, it was like as you were saying, Will, about setting yourself goals, set them small. I think I was setting myself then these really super high goals as in I need to get a super duper job. If I'm going to work for someone, it has to be the most amazing job because I feel I've let myself down. I feel I have failed. I'm this big failure in life. And so I started to um, look and spend ages on these applications. And I was setting myself up to fail already because my CV had to be adapted each and every time. And I'm like, okay, well, I have done that in the past and I used to be this and I'm trying to piece these things together. But it was, it was having a bit of a negative impact on me. And so I thought, oh, I don't want to be failing. This is making me feel worse. Let me go back to what I love, what I'm so passionate about. Let me make this work. So I just kind of got the focus back to where I personally want to be. And I know this has been for a number of other people. And I just want to mention also when Paul, I've known Paul Whitnell for, for many, many years from the um, Irish Business Networks years ago when I was involved with all of, all of them. And he'd, he'd called me and he said, oh, Sandy, you know, we're thinking of doing this in, in January, this uh, bit of boot camp. And, uh, you know, do you want to be involved? And I thought, uh, I don't know what, three mornings a week, 8 a.m., three. I mean, I'm up early every morning, but that means I've got to do my hair and makeup, look a bit presentable if I'm going to do this. But it's been one of the best things I've became involved with because it's gave me a purpose. It gave me my mojo back to think, well, this is what I love doing. This, it gave me my push to go forward again and then think about virtual retreats. Okay, how, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make this work? So yeah, I think there's been a lot of negative impact on many people, but we've just got to try and, as Will said, 
it's okay if you've got that within you and you can turn it around. But if you don't, it's got to be tiny steps at a time. Make these changes. Because if you set yourself up to failure, it's just going to get, you're going to get lower and lower and just feel a lot more, be very tough on yourself. And this could spiral into real mental problems, you know, which, which hence could be depression and, you know, even worse from there, which is very sad. So lots of impact. <laughs> yeah. And, and Will, maybe you could just comment on our capacity to respond mentally when the uh, pandemic and the lockdown hit so suddenly. And I'm, I'm thinking I'm contrasting it with the response that some companies had on the technology side because some companies had sufficient tech support in place so people could literally overnight start working from home. And the technical change is instant and lasting and no, no big deal. However, the physical change and then the mental adjustment is a completely different ball game. And you're playing catch up. Well, I'm not sure, do I like working from home? How does the technology work? Uh, should I start work early? How, how long should I work? Can I take a break in the middle of the day for two hours or three hours? All these things are sort of going through your head because suddenly you're forced to do something quite different. So could you comment on that, Will, and, and our capacity to respond effectively in that stressed situation? Absolutely. It come, comes back a bit to what I was saying before about responsibility, right? So the, the beauty of if you take 100% responsibility for anything that's going on in your life at any given point, you're in power. Now, things will happen that aren't your fault, right? But they are your responsibility. And if we always come from that place, then we can always be empowered to be able to, to, to create an outcome that, that we want. And you're exactly right. Some businesses were, were set up in a way where it was much easier for them to pivot and change and adapt because they'd already had certain technologies in place. Some people didn't. And the first part of that responsibility is, is an acceptance, right? It's accepting as it is, not seeing it better than it is, not seeing it worse than it is, but accepting it for what it is. Um, and then you can start to, to really make some changes and, 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 and evolve from there. And um, in, in NLP, we talk about the person with the most flexibility is the one that controls the system. Um, and the system in this instance isn't uh, a computer system. It's, it's our life, right? It's we, if, we are, if we stay flexible, we control the system. I, the, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but there's a Bruce Lee quote, which is something on the lines of be like water, my friend. You know, the, the more that we can be flexible and ebb and flow, the, the better. You know, it's when we're rigid is when we snap. Um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of where we, where we want to be able to put ourselves into a position with. And a lot of the work that I did, I've been very fortunate that I made a conscious decision about five years ago, um, having had a big business with 85 staff and a big office. And like, I didn't want to be fixed in one place and have to have that, that focus um, uh, again. So I created my virtual business and I had 18 different people, part of my company that we've got now that were plugged in in various components, some part-time, some full-time, whatever. Um, and we all work virtually. So I'd learned over the last five years, what works and what doesn't work in a virtual capacity. And it's something that some people have never experienced. And coming back to the, 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 the piece that we were talking about before with that, that example that I gave of logical levels of change, what had to change for a lot of people was their, um, their, their belief around their working structure most people we, we human beings we're creatures of habit they some people for 20 30 plus years have had their structure they get up at set time they get on the train they get on the bus or they drive to work at a set time they have their lunch at a set time they know where their work is their, their desk is as it should be and, and that's through lots of people and what a lot of people didn't do is create a new one and it's taking that time to go, right, well, I need to replace my old structure with my new structure, which might be creating that work environment. For Sandy, it's working on her island there, um, uh, as, as you mentioned. Um, uh, for, for me, I, I made conscious decisions in, in my office to do certain things differently and, and to enable that environment to be better. So it, it was some real practical stuff around structure. You know, um, a lot of people, they were literally going out of one room into the next room and they're in work in there all day leaving that room and then going and and um and, and being in another room again and it's it's all of the little things that people forget that happen in a typical working day 
going to the, the water cooler and getting a glass of water and having a chat with someone, um, going into the kitchen and, and having that chat with someone, pop into the shop for 10 minutes to go and grab a coffee and coming back in. A lot of that, those breaks that would be very natural that we wouldn't even consciously think that we're taking, we just weren't taking, you know, that, that wind up on the way into work when you're driving into work or you get in the train or whatever it is, or the wind down on the way home wasn't happening. And, and, and on top of that, obviously all the, the, um, homeschooling and everything else everyone did, needed to do. So my, my advice to, to lots of people then and still is now for the people that are struggling with it, create a new structure that has a, an element of what your old structure looked like in some way. So turn the laptop off at a particular time, turn it on at a particular time, have that, don't allow everything to blur into one, which is very easy to do. Um, and uh, around July, August time, um, no, a bit later than that. It was around September time. A lot of my clients were getting really close to burnout. And the reason for that was because so many people weren't taking holiday, right? Because most people think, oh, I, I don't want to use, at the time we were hoping it wasn't going really to last long because they didn't want to use up their holiday. What's the point in taking days off work just to sit in my living room? I might as well be working was kind of the approach that a lot of people had. But that they wouldn't do that normally. Every three months, they might have had a few days off or had a break. And, and that's not even necessarily gone to another country. Um, or, or, or gone to another part of the, the UK, which obviously we, we can't really do right now. Um, but they just, they weren't taking that break. And I think that's really important as well is the, if, uh, again, I'm going to paraphrase the quote, but it's something along the lines of, um, without silence in music, it would just be noise. And we, we, we need to have those silence. We need the, the, the blank space um, in between what we're doing to, to to not feel like everything's blurring into one and, and to give ourselves some time to just release. I think we could all do with a couple of weeks on a nice sunny beach, quite frankly. Oh, and, you know, yeah. it's interesting, Will, because you touch on a couple of things there. And we really don't have time to get into them in detail now. But, you know, we've talked about physical and mental resilience, but there's also social resilience and emotional resilience and that lack of social interaction is a definite consequence of lockdown of remote working and the lack of ability to interact face to face and and that's something we're also dealing with um and there's ways around that as well but look we have about uh, four or five minutes left and i'm conscious that we could probably talk for hours but i had a couple of questions that were sent in in advance when folks knew that you are both going to be on the on the show so sandy let me quickly start with you this is a, a question that came in from somebody in ireland in fact what desk exercises can i do in between zoom meetings to stay flexible that's a good one. It's something we've covered in the bits of boot camp also, because one of the problems people have, they're hunching over a desk throughout the day, whether they're in the office or they're at home. It's just a natural way we tend to just hold ourselves, which is not good. So we can just roll our shoulders up and back while we're still seated. Obviously, standing would be preferable and just raising our arms up and just leaning to the one side, back to the middle, the other side, and then just using your opposite hand to go to the other side of the chair. And then the other way, you're just giving your spine a nice rotation there just to give it a bit of a stretch. Obviously, shoulder rolls, we've got neck turns, there's numerous things we can do, but um, I think improving the posture is something which will help us physically and mentally as well anyway. I mean, if we're walking along, hunch down, whereas if we roll our shoulders back and up and we stand tall and we're proud, it makes us happier and a bit more positive. So yes. Very good. One other question for you, and this came from somebody in Liverpool actually, uh, Sandy. I'm starting a diet the day after my birthday this month to lose weight. What's the best way to ease into it? Um, one of the biggest things to make just changes, which I think is quite an easy change, is try to start avoiding processed foods. So even on two days a week, if you start with two days a week, avoid processed foods, you will already be introducing yourself to a more healthier, wholesome diet and making it from fresh is always going to be better for you. I mean, introducing juicing also is a, just a great way to get the nutrients into you. If you had just one juice a day, 
You can throw a load of veggies and um, fruits into there and just get the nutrients, so omega-3s, all everything into you directly, which will give you a little boost of energy also. Very good. Okay, thank you. A couple of quick questions for you, Will, and this is one from somebody in London. What has been the most rewarding aha moment that someone has had during one of your workshops? Um, wow, what a great question. Um, what, what one that stands out because it just it got said to me recently um, was with a particular individual who'd, who'd been in therapy, eight different therapists over 10 years. And the, 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 the just saw a, a tear of inspiration um, in his eyes where he believed, where we changed some, some sort of internal dialogue that he had um, around some stuff from the past that, that enabled him to really progress and see a future. And then I got a message from him saying that he got more out of 90 minutes with me than um, than 10 years and of, of therapy with eight different therapists. So that's that's a recent one that stands out. But there's been there's been, there's been a fair few. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a recent one that, that stands out, which was which was pretty cool. Very good. And one other question for you, Will: Who is the most famous person you've ever worked with? Um, I suppose the finest to work with. Obviously, I've got to be mindful of, of client confidentiality. Um, I, it, we won't of, tell anyone. <laughs> I, actually, working with as a client, um, I have. Uh, let's see, who do I know that I can definitely talk about? Well, you um, could genericize, maybe football players or. Yeah, so I, 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 one of the I've, I've had the privilege of of consulting for one of the the uh, the, the most current boxing um, champions. Um, I had the privilege of working for, for many years with one of the, the winners of Britain's Got Talent and a lot of the work that we did um, has, has sort of had an impact on, on their career. So that was that was pretty great. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a there's a, a couple. Very good. Look, uh, I'm conscious that we have about a minute left. So, Sandy, I'll go to you very, very quickly. When it comes to physical resilience in these challenging times, what's your number one tip? to help people be more physically resilient? Um, if you can get yourself out three to five times a week for at least a minimum 20 minutes, even if it's for a walk, just try to escalate that heart rate up a little bit so you feel a bit breathless as you're, as you're walking, you're talking. If that's the best you can do, it's better than nothing. So rather than just staying in, get yourself up and out. Obviously, I'd love to say go for a run, do a boxing class, you know, whatever. But let's be realistic. And just if you can get yourself out and be a little active and stay hydrated, you know, water's very good for you. You've got to drink plenty throughout the day. Great stuff. Get active, drink water. Will, same question to you. Mental resilience, your top tip for us all to help stay mentally resilient what one of my personal so pretty much non-negotiables is meditate actually um so meditate people that aren't familiar with meditation um then they they can use apps like insight timer which are free which are really good guided meditation um i'm, I'm a, a huge fan of um so meditation would be one um do a daily practice you uh, get my words out a daily practice of gratitude so um, get a, a little journal or pen and paper and write down 10 things you're grateful for. Not just the things that have all gone really well, but the things that have happened that if they hadn't have happened would have been a real inconvenience. You know, like you're grateful for the fact that the toilet flushed, grateful for the fact that there was hot water, grateful for the fact that the, the fridge stayed on overnight and all the food didn't go off. Um, that, that kind of stuff is, is really powerful. Um, and then what would be another one other than exercise, which um, we've already mentioned, I would say... Um, What's another one that I would say for mental resilience? Have, have a clarity of your vision. So keep really clear on where you're going. I, I'm a big believer that clarity creates certainty. Certainty creates confidence. So if you get really clear on where you're going, if lots of things have had to change over the last year, so that that vision of where you're going is, is a bit different, um, then fine, you know, but get clear on where you're going, reverse engineer that. So if it's an ultimate vision for 20 years down the line, for your personal professional life, then 10 year, five year, three year, one year, 90 day, 30 day, create that trajectory of where you're going, have a plan of goals um, so that you've got something to aim towards so that every morning when you wake up, you've got something to look forward to um, is, is something that will be, be really powerful. 
Fantastic. Look, there's plenty of great material and information there for folks to unpack and digest. So Sandy and Will, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, your inputs have been very welcome and really appreciated. And all it's left for me to say is this has been a bit of business. My name is John Fitzgerald. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.